Hello, today is May 19th, 2009. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our videographer today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. We are privileged today to have with us M. David Cohen. Welcome, David. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. May I ask you where and when you were born? I was born in Brookline, Massachusetts, September 28, 1944, in a hospital that does no longer exist. And which one was that? The Floating Hospital. Boston Floating? Yes. And where are you currently living? In Framingham. And your marital status? I'm not married. Do you have children? I have a daughter who will be 23 in July. And if I may add, she just graduated from George Washington University cum laude. Congratulations. Very proud of her. You should be. That's wonderful. Where and when did you enter the military? I went into the Air Force in, on June 25th, 1962. And I was supposed to be separated four years later. However, since I was in Europe, they chose to extend my service so they could reassign me back to the States. And I actually was discharged aug in August 25th of 1966. So you were in for six years? No, I was in for four years I'm and two sorry. months. Four years. And two months. Right. Tell me, um, why did you join in 1962? I had interviewed with and been awarded scholarships to three Jewish theological seminaries. My intent was to become a rabbi. Um, there were a lot of reasons why I wasn't sure quite which denomination to go to, Orthodox, Conservative, Reform. I was Orthodox at the time, but I saw the future of Judaism in Reform. Uh, not to my parents' liking, I might tell you. Anyway, uh, the dean at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati was the person involved with uh, identifying and assigning Jewish chaplains. So I told him my concerns, and he said, why don't we do this? I will have you go to Lackland Air Force Base. We will assign you as a chaplain's assistant, and you'll get to work in the field for your entire four years. And that sounded like a wonderful thing to me. I went to Texas, uh, Lackland Air Force Base. Uh, I went through the chaplain's assistant program, and they were about to, and I got to know the base chaplain and the Jewish chaplain, and I was all set to travel wherever he was assigned, and he was given a humanitarian discharge. Now I had no rabbi, there were none coming into the chaplain school, and the people who were making the assignment said, you know, you can't possibly handle this yourself. And I said, why don't you ask Rabbi Schwartzman, Samuel Schwartzman? And so they did, and he said, he can handle it. So you had them ask him if you could handle yeah, it. Yeah, because mm -hmm. he was the dean of the Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. And he was the one who was my reference, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I took over the Jewish chaplain program at Lackland Air Force Base, Texas. Um, they sent me home for a week. And then they sent me, uh, you had to go to the chaplain school, where everyone was ordained except me. And your assignment was based upon how you finished in your class. You got to choose your assignment. Well, there were very limited Jewish positions. There were four. One was Westover Air Force Base right here in Massachusetts. And I laughed heartily at that. I said, that's not why I went in the service. Um, I ended up choosing between Tachikawa Air Base in Japan and Paris, France. And it so back up sure. for one minute. Why did you choose the Air Force? Well, if I told you I like the blue uniforms, that, you know. It, that could be why. No, I, I chose it because um, uh, Rabbi Schwartzman said that of the three branches, the four branches at that time, um, the, the better opportunity for me to do what I really wanted to do would be in the Air Force. There were many going into the Army, very few in the Air Force and very few in the Marines. Did any other family, how old were you at that point in time? Seventeen. So you were just out of high school? Just out. I'd never gra I never graduated, but I never attended the ceremony because on the day of the graduation ceremony, I was on a plane to Lackland Air Force Base. 
Did any family or friends join the service at the same time as you? No. My father had been in World War II. He emigrated from Kiev, Russia in 1923, and he served the entire World War II as part of the Army Air Corps. So you went to Lackland, yes. you went to chaplain school. I went to the chaplain's assistant school first, mm -hmm. and then to the chaplain school. I graduated first in my class, so I got to choose all these ordained people and me. And, and so did you also go through any kind of a basic training? Absolutely. Similar yeah. to the others? Exactly the same as the others. What was it like for you? Um, I really didn't think I was going to survive. I mean, here was this nice Jewish kid from Everett, Massachusetts, and we're out there uh, running and climbing. And I mean, I had never done any of that. I went from public school to Hebrew school, went to home to do homework, and back to public school. So I didn't have all of this. Uh, and then when we started going in, they'd, they'd put us into a, a big room, and they'd throw gas in. And you had a gas mask, but you couldn't put it on until they told you. And people were falling all over the place. And I'm saying, you know, I'll tell you what I actually said. I said, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, which is, Hero Israel, the Lord our God. And I just kept repeating it. And I said, until I pass out, I'm going to, and somehow I managed to get through. And um, even there, I was very fortunate in, in achieving. Uh, there was a program called the American Spirit of Honor Medal that was given to an enlisted man who graduated at the top of his class. And I was awarded that in the graduation ceremonies. Shocked everybody, including me. I thought they were going to wheel me out of there in, on a stretcher. So along with the religious aspects of your job, you were also getting physically fit for whatever was in your Very future. much so, yes. How long were you at Lackland? From June 25th until the end of November of 1962. And then you had the choice, getting back to your choices of Japan or Paris. Well, I had the others, but they were domestic, and there was no way I was going to do you that. Wanted to see and I wanted to go to Europe. Had you ever been out of the States before? I had never been out of Massachusetts, except visiting a cousin when I was very young down in Florida. So what was Texas like for you? Uh, very weird. Why? Uh, the second day I was there, this young African-American from West Virginia came up to me and he kept walking around and I finally said can I help you with something he said they told me you're Jew and I said yeah I said where's the horns and tail and I thought he was joking he was not joking he had never seen a Jew before and he thought we all had horns and tails so I took my thumb and I went I guess they're not working today <laughs> and we became very good friends we very still stay in touch. His name is Richard Allen. Yeah. yeah. Very Westport, Newport News, West Virginia. He came from there. And his name again? Richard Allen, A-L-L-E-N. And you still stay in touch with him? Yep. Yeah, he stayed in. He's a career uh, enlisted, and I got out after four years and two months. Something that I've always questioned myself about, because I think had I stayed, uh, I would have really enjoyed the military chaplaincy. Making it more of a career. Absolutely. Did you receive any advanced training beyond basic? Just administrative training, mm -hmm. but no other uh, combat training. So when you had that choice um, to make, where did you choose to go? To France. Why? Well, first of all, there's something romantic about the Mediterranean countries. And uh, Japan and China and Korea didn't have the same, fa hold the same fascination for me. And when they told me I wasn't just going to be in France, I was going to be going to France, Spain, Morocco, and Libya as a circuit chaplain, I was even more thrilled. Then they told me that I was going to be doing Torah convocations in Berchtesgaden, Germany. What kind of convocations? Torah convocations. It's R&R, mm -hmm. morale uh, class, morale. People would, would get a five-day pass, and they would come, and they would be given dynamics of more leadership lectures, is what they called them then. And so you were there to help with that right. program? I would lead the Jewish program. We had Protestants and Catholics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you sent as an individual or as part of a unit? 
to France? Um, well, all of us were sent, we had orders, and I was assigned to the 322nd Air Division. And what part of France? Um, I had bases in, the, the name of the bases were Evreux-Drew and Léon, Chateroux, then we had uh, Wheelis, Libya, City Slimain, uh, Morocco, and um, Torrejon Air Base in Madrid. There were eight altogether. And so how long were you at each air base normally? Three or four days. And then you would I fly out? call base operations. I'd say, what have you got going to Tarahoe? I'd say, we got a T-33 fighter. I said, good. And I'd go down to the uh, flight line, and they would, after the first month or two, they knew who I was, and they would we'd just go. Sometimes a plane would be going to pick up beer for one of the generals, or it might be going to deliver special medical equipment to a base. Whatever was going next. It's, so I've flown on everything there is. I've never piloted, but I have flown on just, if it flies, I was on it. Did you have any close calls while in flight? Never. Because they weren't shooting at us in France, they were shooting in Vietnam. Most of the people with whom I trained who went to Vietnam did not return. Chaplains, you mean? No, I mean just people who came in from the Boston, New England area, because we were all there at the same time. They're meaning? Lackland Air Force Base. Lackland. They trained, they were sent that way. I was, yesterday, two days ago, we had this United Nations Comes to Massachusetts program, and somebody arrived at the town hall. His name is Dave Cantor. Haven't seen him in over 45 years. We went in at the same time. They sent him to Vietnam. They sent me to Europe. And he heard what was happening. He saw the name. He said, there aren't too many M. David Cohens around. So he came to the event, and uh, uh, he went through a lot. And as you said, most of those did not come did back. Not come back. No. Now, when you met up in these different um, air bases, mm -hmm. t tell us typically what your role was on a given day. I, I was to create a Jewish program where none had been. The one one rabbi, an Orthodox rabbi, Robert Weiler, was at every air base and sometimes visited Drew, but he didn't travel. Uh, he was Orthodox, so he was not going to travel on Jewish holidays. When I got there, I was Orthodox, but I quickly realized that to do this job, my personal beliefs weren't going to necessarily be the ones I would practice. And so I gave myself dispensation, and I said, if I need to be there or they're not going to have a service, I'm going. And that's the decision that I made. It was also the same time when I stopped eating kosher food. So you grew up in a kosher home? Totally, totally kosher, orthodox, every Friday night in the synagogue, every Saturday morning, every holiday. Never had, my dad and I would go to Penway Park, but never had a hot dog, never had anything that was not kosher. What changed all that was, I'm sure we'll talk about it later in, in the discussion, but um, we had some people coming in we were buying them out of Romania. They were Jews who were escaping, and the government would look the other way as long as we paid them $500 a head. So we would have plane fulls of people coming into Orly Air Base, and we would have buses from the military base as a volunteer. I mean, this was not official. We'd go out, we'd pick them up, and we'd drive them far out to the western part of the state where they were assigned places to live. There hadn't been Jews in 400 years and most of them were given little pieces of uh, property that were submerged and they became uh, snail or escargot farmers. And so the very first time I had non-kosher food, I went to someone's house who was very poor and worked very hard and he turned out this huge plate of wonderful garlic escargot. I could either say, no, I'm kosher, or I could eat them. And so I had one and there was no turning back. And that's what most of the people out there were doing, that they were farming for snails and mussels and oysters and all of that. So not only were you entrenched in helping 
the servicemen, but you are also helping anyone, as we'll talk about Little Sisters of the Poor. Mm -hmm. I mean, my goal in being there was to provide a pastoral service, to provide a humanitarian service. That's what chaplains do in the service. We don't really care what religion someone is. I'm currently the Jewish chaplain at the Chelsea Soldiers Home as a volunteer. And if I'm walking into a dorm to see a Jewish veteran, and frequently, since there are only 14 out of 459, people will say, you know, chaplain, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm Catholic. I said, of course. And we'd sit down and we'd talk. We didn't necessarily talk about religion. They just wanted some, some of these people don't have visitors for years, if ever. One of our patients, our veterans just died about six weeks ago, and he had been there for 40 years, and he had no family. His only link with the world were the people who were caretakers and the Jewish chaplain. And do they call you chaplain? Yes. Huh. Mm -hmm. Some people call me rabbi, but I'm not a rabbi, mm -hmm. so I correct them. That's, a rabbi has been ordained, and I have not. I have 40 seven years of experience, but I've not been ordained. Now you mentioned earlier that there were eight air bases. Mm -hmm. Talk about the differences in those. It was all culture was the difference. Um, the, the servicemen, of course, were the same because there was a, a, a cross-section of every type of background from Appalachia to Los Angeles to Des Moines, Iowa, I mean, at every base. But the culture of the people was totally different. The culture in France was, there really was a culture and there was wonderful food and the people were very hospitable, uh, although that's not the normal concept or precept. In Paris, they were obnoxious, but it's sort of like being a New Yorker. You know, they're not really Americans, they're New Yorkers. <laughs> and Parisians are not really French, they're Parisian. People out in the countryside were terrific. If you made the effort to try to either speak the language or communicate in a way that they could understand, they would go more than halfway to meet you. And did you learn French? I learned French. I still have some of it. But when I got there, I didn't know a word. And I spent as much time as I could when I wasn't doing something official out in what we called the economy. The economy was where everyone who wasn't military would live. Uh, somebody would tell me that there was this great restaurant where all the guys from Boston hung out. I wouldn't go there. But if I could go to a place where they were only speaking French, it was, a, I would call it immersion. And you, 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 you're forced, if you want a glass of water or you want to, to die of thirst, you learn how to ask for a glass of water. And, uh, and that's what I did. It was very difficult in Libya and Morocco because it was not safe for Jews to be off the base. Because Spain. of their dislike or? Well, because of the, the culture of the people and uh, you know, Jews and uh, Americans generally, but specifically Jews, were not very well received. Did you ever come into contact with a negative situation in A number the, of times, yeah. You want to it, talk it, about it any didn't, of that? Well, it, it never was allowed to get out of hand because if I went off base, I never went alone. There'd always be four or five of us. We'd go out to have dinner, we'd go out to go to, to a, a soccer match or something. And um, typically, because the men on the base wore a uniform, what did you wear? I wore civilian clothes. Um, if the only time that I had to wear a uniform was we flew up to Tempelhof Air Base, which was Berlin, 1963. I was there in, in Europe from 62 to 65. And if I wanted to get on the tour bus and go into East Berlin, I had to be in uniform and I had to have my ID card. And that was the only time I was required to have it, as other than when I was flying. When you, I flew from base to base, you had to be in uniform. But I never conducted services in a uniform. Tell us what a service might be like. A typical Friday night service is called Erev Shabbat, the eve of Sabbath. Um, Normally would run 30 to 40 minutes, um, have a number of prayers, a number of, of uh, readings that I would pass out to the people who were assembled. Uh, grant us peace, thy most precious gift of our eternal source of peace, and enable us to be the messengers of peace to the world, that kind of thing. Um, we'd have a Torah service occasionally, 
we would take the five books of Moses that are on the scrolls out and we would read from it because the, the Torah is read from beginning to end once a year. So you start um, at Sukkot, which is um, Simchat Torah. It's right after Yom Kippur, usually in October. Uh, and you read the first part. And then every week you roll it and you keep reading. And it's, it's timed so that you get to the very last part on that day the next year and you roll back to the beginning and start over again. Now you said earlier that there are times when you also um, speak with those of other religions. Did those of other religions attend any of your services? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. At the Chelsea Soldiers Home, many do. Mm -hmm. But I also will take the Jewish congregation into St. Michael's, which is the Catholic chapel. Uh, Father uh, Patrick Healy is the Catholic chaplain. He's been there for 40 years. The Protestant chaplain is Jack Bird. And we all do things together. As a matter of fact, I started a program when I was assigned there in November. Uh, and again, they are full-time paid employees, and I'm a volunteer. Uh, so I, I said, okay, we're going to do things together if you want to, and they, they were thrilled. So I said, how about if we call it Three Chaplains No Waiting Presents? And so that, that spread through the place very quickly. And we did our first combined concert February 13th. We had a 20-voice chorus, uh, the Broadmoor Chamber Singers. They actually appeared here in Morse uh, when you had the, that celebration, the 150th. They've appeared here many times, okay. yes. Yeah. And we They're also from had, this area. Yes, right. Natick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we had uh, Rebecca Liu, who is a platinum CD-selling country western. And we had it in St. Michael's Chapel, which is much larger than the Jewish chapel. Getting back to the 1960s, yes. did you befriend any particular service men or women? Uh, a number of service men or women, but mostly the chaplains, because I was in contact with a lot of them. Father Driscoll and I stayed in touch uh, until he died. Um, Glenn Tesco was the base chaplain at one of the bases. Um, he was married, had eight children, they were all in Maine. He was there by himself, and then he went back and became the chaplain at um, uh, University of Vermont. So yes, I've stayed in touch with a number of them. Why don't you show the picture? I think we sure. can. We'll think also the, have this scanned for yeah. our website and Do tell us think, about this. You think that you the just, reflection, or, or should I? No, I can just, just take it, like it out. That. If you, no, yeah? That's okay. Um, this is an interesting picture that was taken in around 1963. Um, there's a very young man right there. That's, Let's that's not me. Cover your uh, mic. Oh, I'm Thanks. sorry. Right there, there's, uh, I'm here. This is Mother Mary Pascal, who's the Mother Superior of the, in France, they were Les Petits Sœurs des Pauvres. In English, the Little Sisters of the Poor. This is Father Jimmy Driscoll, who is from Seton Hall. He's a Jesuit. These nuns are all Irish, and they were assigned to an old folks home, which is what they called it, in El Buff, France. Um, and they took care of the people that are standing behind them. And tell us how you got involved with this group. Um, Father Driscoll and I and uh, uh, Chaplain Nelson, who was the Protestant chaplain, would s frequently sit and talk about what was happening and how we could do things together, how we could support each other's programs. And uh, he said, you know, I want you to meet some people that are very dedicated and every day they get dressed and they go out and they beg on the streets. That's how they eat and that's how they put fuel in the, in the heating system, and, uh, and they're not young people. And I said, well, there's got to be something we can do about it. And I went down to the, uh, the kitchen area, the mess hall, and I noticed that they were throwing out a lot of food. And so I spoke to the sergeant, who was the, the mess sergeant, we called him, uh, and I said, what's going on? And he said, well, the military, this is back in 1962, 3, 4, 5, dated food like we do now, but that didn't happen here in the United States, domestic. Um, and I said, well, what do you do with it? Well, if we look at the date, and if it, the date is today, May 19th, tomorrow, in the trash. That's the rule, that's the law. I said, um, what if I back the truck up? Can I have what you're throwing away? And he said, sure, there's nothing wrong with it. That's the last day we can serve it. Doesn't mean it's bad. Okay, so we got a hold of people in the motor pool. 
they allowed us to borrow trucks, some of the drivers volunteered, and they would park and instead of anything going in the dumpster, it would go in the truck. And they would take it out to the Little Sisters of the Poor. Well, they couldn't possibly use all the food that we were bringing to them. So they started distributing the food to all of the other needy people. In, they didn't have food banks per se, but they had churches and they had community centers and the, uh, the mayor, uh, the, the building where the mayor was, City Hall, was called the Prefet. And so they would just distribute, they became the food distributors, which really is sort of like the Meals on Wheels that we have now. And it all happened because, I, to this day, I, I, people who know me will know that I just don't throw things away because there's always somebody who has less. And they, they, the first week, they actually, some of them became ill because they weren't used to having ice cream and fresh eggs and oranges and orange juice. Everything was powdered, everything was old, and, and they really had to adjust because, and, and it just kept coming. As far as I know, it went on until they closed the bases. Ironically, every base that I served in France, Spain, Morocco, and Libya is no longer a U.S. base. And what is it? Is it part of the, their... The, the French took over mm -hmm. the bases in France. Mm -hmm. uh, they assigned an officer who was a rank higher than the American officer, and they became as a French base and a Spanish base in Morocco and Libya. Tell us about the, the, the climate in the different areas, too. Um, the, you're talking about weather climate or yes. cultural? Cl um, weather climate. It was obviously much warmer in Libya and Morocco. Uh, Spain was more temperate. And, and France was very much like San Francisco. Um, it was uh, uh, very hot when it got hot, and it was rather cold when it got cold. And when it snowed, it, there were storms like we have here in New England. Uh, one of the most exciting parts of living in that part of the world was they didn't have the, the channel, the channel tunnel that exists today. So I would drive up to either Calais or Dunkirk, stay overnight, and the next morning get on the first ferry, and you would go across as the sun was rising on the white cliffs of Dover. Really breathtaking. So while you were there, did you have the ability on your R&R to do any traveling over there? Yes, I visited 44 countries between Europe and Asia. When I came back, and I was separated from the service, I, I really decided I wasn't going to lose that part of the world. And I started traveling regularly to Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. At the very end of that travel period, I could go into mainland China, but very briefly. You could go in, I think, 20 miles on a bus. Now, of course, people fly in and out. They're actually starting, I think it's December, direct service from Beijing to Boston, nonstop service this will become the U.S. port for travel to China. So back in the 60s, you were traveling? Yeah, and prop what was, planes. What was it like, f for instance, traveling into China? Well, the... the it was very limited, the, as you said. That happened, yeah, that happened after I was separated from the service. Okay. Because I was only in Europe, and once I got to go to India, uh, I was in Russia, but as far as Asia, it was after the service. When I was traveling, everything was prop planes. Uh, we would stop in Iceland and refuel. I mean, it was just, took forever, but not as bad as my dad, who they had ships and it took them weeks and weeks to travel. So. When you um, were in Europe, did you hear about the progress of the war that was going on in Vietnam? Yes. And what were you hearing and how did you hear it? Well, the official description was one, one was described one way. And what we heard from the people on the field and from the other chaplains uh, was very different. Uh, and it turned out that what we were hearing from the chaplains uh, was very accurate. In that there may have been positive exaggerations on the officials' part? That may have been. There were there significant exaggerations. And did you have um, radio contact, or did you have news or newspapers? Uh, well, the Stars and Stripes, but Stars and Stripes was the official version. So it said what the military wanted it to say. One of the things that, that I'm sure people watching this tape will, will comprehend is that chaplains are a whole different breed 
from military. I mean, we're in the service, we have rank, we have to be respectful of the command, but we have a higher authority. It's like that Hebrew National hot dog ad. <laughs> so our goal was, you know, somebody was being reassigned from Spain to Vietnam. Um, but we didn't sugarcoat it. You know, we told them what we knew. They didn't have a choice, and we didn't have a choice. They were going. They could have sent me at any minute. Any one of us. I were mean, you concerned about going over no. there? No. Mm -hmm. If that's where I was going to go, that's where I was going to go. Do you feel, because you, you weren't a rabbi, mm -hmm. but do you feel that you received proper training for the position that you held? Absolutely. It wasn't military training. Mm -hmm. the, the, and again, let me explain. A priest and a minister are to a great deal intercessors between man and God. Not so in the Jewish faith. In the Jewish faith, it's whoever happens to be the most well-educated at the time in that community is the one who leads the community. A rabbi, the rabbi, the word itself means teacher. It doesn't mean priest. I happen to, my last name is Cohen, and a Kohen happens to be a priest. But that's really coincidental. So it wasn't that I was doing anything unique. If I'm conducting a service at the Chelsea Soldiers Home, and a good friend of mine who was a rabbi in Malden, he's now in Connecticut, Rabbi Tom Alpert, if he were to come to my service, I would defer to him, I would sit down and let him conduct the service. He might not accept, but I would feel I should defer. You're obligated to at least... Not, not really obligated, I, it's just I would recognize the fact that he is far more capable than I and he's going to bring a whole new level of, of information to the congregation. Uh, and I, I've done that all my life. You know, so there are many times when there are people, I have a young man that just converted to Judaism. He was uh, Catholic until two years ago. He started coming to the services in Malden that I was conducting, Temple to Firth Israel, and he converted. And nobody asked him to. We, we, we never said, you can't be here, but as you also probably well know, Jews do not proselytize. If someone comes to me and says they want to convert to Judaism, my first question is going to be, what are you now? Well, I'm Presbyterian, good. How much do you know about being a Presbyterian? And we send them back to their clergy to find out, but you, you cannot convert from nothing to something. You can embrace a new religion. But converting is you had something and you're going in another direction. So I want people to have something. That's why when I hear parents say, well, we'll let him decide when he grows up. You, by that time, it's too late. They're not going to decide. They're just going to be indifferent. So and they have to start with something. Yes. A base. Absolutely. And I just want to make one other comment. I didn't know this until April 6th or 7th of this year. I was preparing to conduct the first interfaith Seder ever at the Chelsea Soldiers Home since 1896 when they opened their doors. I had the leader of the Episcopal Church with me. I had Protestant, a Buddhist, a Hindu, and a Sufi. And, and if you know Hebrew, there's a part in the Seder when everyone holds up a piece of matzah, unleavened bread, and says the words, Halach ma'anya, this is the bread of affliction that our forefathers made in haste as they were leaving Egypt. And to have all of these people holding up the matzah from every different faith. We even had a man from Tibet who played a 10-foot long dung dien, which is the, ten, the horn like re go la. He was there at the Seder playing the horn as people came in. I mean, it was, it was wonderful. Uh, we already have 18 reservations for next year. And one of them is the Consul General of Israel and a representative of Cardinal O'Malley. Now, while, while you're a chaplain in the service, did you gain rank? Did you... I was an enlisted man. And what was your... I went in as an, a basic airman. I came out as a staff sergeant. And you got out in 66? August 25th, 1966. Eglin Air Force Base, Florida. If you know Florida at all, there's Pensacola and there's Panama City and everything between is Eglin Air Force Base. 740,000 acres. 
What was your fe- were you coming home then to Massachusetts after yes. that? And what was your feeling about coming home? Uh, well, I was looking forward to it. I hadn't seen my brother in a while. Uh, he's five years younger. We just had lunch today. And, uh, and I had plans, and I, I wanted to get on with it. It was really interesting to me also that most of the people my age at that time uh, were just turning 21. They were just going out and drinking. And Well, when you live in Europe, Every, you want a glass of wine, you have a glass of wine. No, I never was carded. I mean, I found the whole thing ridiculous. Um, and, uh, and I was just looking forward to it. I, I had uh, a very good friend, who be, a fellow who became a very good friend, Tom Agnew. And his father had a car dealership in Newburgh, New York. He had a picture of this beautiful Tahitian coral Cadillac convertible. His father was a Cadillac dealer. And every time you opened his locker, there it was. And everybody would comment on it. And we, we became really good friends. And, and as I was leaving, he said, uh, I spoke to my dad, and I'm going to be here for three more years. So if you want to buy the car, I'll sell you my car. And I said, you're kidding. He said, no. And he told me how much he wanted, which was a joke. It was a pittance. And um, I gave him the money, gave him the information. I flew back to uh, McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey. His father met me. They drove me to his house in Newburgh, New York. The car was registered in my name. I got in the car, I went home, and then I turned around and drove down to Florida to Eglin Air Force Base. And then you were discharged from there? From there, eight months later, yeah. And then, so what were you doing at Eglin while you were? I was the acting Jewish chaplain for eight months. And how do you spell that Air Force Base? E-G-L-I-N, Eglin Air Force Base. It's actually uh, officially in Fort Walton Beach but it's a huge span of property. And not only Air Force trained, it's the largest uh, tactical base in the Air Force, but the First Army was there, the helicopters were there. I mean, there was all kinds of training. Very much like Camp Pendleton, Marine Base on the West Coast. Now you mentioned earlier that getting home and you had plans. Mm -hmm. What were your plans? Uh, My plans were to marry and to uh, complete my college. I had gotten several years while I was in the service with the University of Maryland Extension courses and uh, completed my studies at Boston College. And were they studies in theology? Or? No, no. I, by that point I had pretty well decided that wasn't the way I was going. So I was studying business and uh, psychology. And did you finish? Yes. And, and then for your full-time position outside of your chaplaincy, what did you do? After college? Mm-hmm. Um, I started working for a company called Gilbert Lane Personnel. They were executive headhunters. 500 Boylston Street, Boston, where there was the Howard Johnsons in those days. Now it is a beautiful, columned, granite building. But in those days, it was at, we were over the Howard Johnson's ice cream shop. And we would interview people who were just getting out of the service because Vietnam was winding down. And I did that for two years. And then a friend of mine uh, from France um, had been cast as a lead in a television program. And she invited me to come out to California. Uh, New Year's Eve, January 1st, 1970. I arrived at Los Angeles Air Base. It was freezing cold, nasty, rotten in Boston. I get there and they have a convertible for me and it's 76 degrees. And I said, why would I ever go back? So I stayed a week or so and I came back. I packed everything up and I moved to California. And were you part of the TV? No, I had nothing to do with the TV. It was Mm -hmm. just that she was there. Mm -hmm. And that was a good enough reason for me. Ultimately, we did not marry, but we stayed friends to this day. And uh, her parents were very dear friends. Her dad just died. Uh, He was my dentist in France at the base where I was. She was a student at the Sorbonne. And how long did you stay in L.A.? Uh, 32 years. And what did you do out there? I started a business consulting firm, which basically has carried over to what I do now. Uh, we would do business consulting, but we would also produce shows and, and do networking with nonprofits. Uh, two days ago, we had 
all 192 flags of the United Nations, and we had a number of programs here. The next one I'm doing is August 21st and 22nd, Boston City Hall Plaza. We're expecting 125,000 people. It's called Green Fest, the greening of Massachusetts. Which is a perfect time to be doing this. Yep. When and I'm bringing all the flags back from New York, and we're going to do it again. Now, when did you get involved with the uh, Chelsea Naval? Is it hospital well, or home? You know, it, it's not naval. There, there was one, but that's closed. This okay. is the Chelsea Soldiers Home. Soldiers Home. Right. The so Chelsea Naval is now a group of apartments and condominiums called uh, Academy, or I don't, I don't remember what it's called, but it's not there anymore. So the Soldiers Home is a retirement home for? It is, yes, long-term skilled care. And there is some assisted living. When you cross the Zaken Bridge and you get on the Tobin Bridge and you get off the Tobin Bridge and you look up, there's a huge red and white checkered water tower. That is the Chelsea Soldiers Home location. And when did you get involved with I started there November four, officially November 14th of 2008. How did you get started there? Uh, the gentleman who, a revered gentleman, I should say, Bernard Becker, had been conducting services as a volunteer for over 40 years. Uh, my parents, I lived in Everett growing up, and my parents still lived in Everett at that time, were very supportive, and they would go up there Friday nights and have services with him. He became very ill last April. He died in September. The national commander of the Jewish war veterans, Ira Novoselsky, and I had been talking about ways that I could help because he was no longer able to do it. And I got a phone call uh, on November 1st asking me if I would accept the responsibility for the Jewish program, which involves the holidays and Friday night and Passover seders and all of that. And I said, absolutely. I was in shock. I had, I didn't, had no idea this was coming. And I said, he said, I know you're really busy. I said, I'm not too busy to do this. And so we started November 14th, and we're building a congregation. Um, just this month of May, I've had eight people contact me that are going to become members of the congregation. I in, instead of calling it the Jewish Chapel Program, which it has been since 1896, it's now called Shir Hashirim, which is Song of Songs. And we have a lot of music all the time. Some of it Jewish related, some of it totally not related, but it's music. Because people, if you feed them and you entertain them, they will come. Did you join any unit of the military reserve when you got out of the service? Um, I was officially part of Massachusetts Air National Guard, I think. I never had to go to a meeting because I served, the minimum active duty was two years and I had served twice that. Uh, one of the awards they gave me, and I don't even know what they're called, was for longevity. Because if you served more than two years, you got this award, and if you served more than four years, you got something else. And, and did you join any other veterans organizations? The Jewish War Veterans. 1966, my father walked me down the aisle. I was the youngest man by maybe 30 years. They're all passed away now. There's not one of the people left. They've disbanded the post. And so I now am part of Post 100, which is a post without a, a, a physical building. And. Uh, I continue my involvement with that and, and with other groups. Um, a month ago, April 14th, I delivered chaplain's message at the Battle of the Bulge Survivor Veterans. Their chaplain was ill and he has since died. And so I've been invited to come to their meetings and serve as their chaplain. And these are all people 90 plus. They, were, they fought in uh, Belgium and many of their comrades are buried in Flanders fields where the poppies grow. They were at our event this past Sunday carrying their banner. One was 91, one was 94. It must be very heartwarming for you to see this type it really of is. camaraderie continue. And, and the other thing is, when I got out of the service, people literally, you hear the stories, but I can tell you personally, people would spit at me and cross the street. Because oh, of you were the a Vietnam. baby killer. Yeah. Now, um, George Ratham in Marlboro invited me to put a vehicle in the parade on Labor Day. And we had a parade that had veterans on the side and I had veterans sitting behind me. 
and every time we drove by a group of people, they would stand and applaud. What a different culture for the soldier today to be so respected. You know, and, and you often hear, you may not agree with the war, you may not agree with the politics, but those soldiers are still putting their necks on the line. And, and it's going to take a lot of years. I don't know the exact number, but it's well over 200,000 that have been seriously injured. They just added 150 rooms to the Chelsea Soldiers' Home. And all, they're all going to Afghan and Iraq. Then once they go in there, they're not coming out. Have you met some in there that have surprised you by their emotional, psychological, or physical state once they've come back? From You're talking about the younger guys? Yes. Oh, absolutely. The, uh, the poster story for this, and this is someone that you, I will invite to come in and do this. His name is James Crosby, and he's, I think, 21. Um, he was in a truck that they were going at some official duty. The truck ran over a mine, blew it up off the ground. Half the people in the truck were killed outright. He's in a wheelchair for life, unless they develop something with stem cell, you know, uh, stem cell research. Anyway, at the same time that they shipped him back here, they cut off his benefits. And he was literally destitute. And so he complained to Congressman Ed Markey, who is our congressman, uh, here and also on the North Shore. And he said, you know, this is absolutely absurd. I did everything. I'm never going to walk again, and I'm not being compensated at all. And Ed Markey filed the Markey Crosby bill, which passed, which meant that you were not terminated from any flow of income until you were designated as a service-connected disability dischargee. And then Congressman Markey hired James Crosby to work in his office to help other veterans. And he now is a part of Congressman Markey's staff because he spoke up and he said, hey, it's not just me. Everybody that I know, he was a patient at the West Roxbury VA Hospital where I also conduct services. And uh, I went to visit him because I heard that we had an influx. Almost every week there's somebody, men and women. A lot, obviously a lot more women today than World War II in Korea. And I got to talk to this guy. He's so well-spoken, so, so articulate and personable, and he's in a chair. There is commentary that there's a lot more post-traumatic stress in the Very. most recent Very true. Service. And you see that oh, yeah. here? Absolutely. Um, the, the worst case uh, example of that uh, there was a, a program done about two months ago with Dr. Phil McGrath. And the woman, um, her name is Tammy Duckworth. She, was the, she lost both legs in Iraq. And she became, in Illinois, the uh, head of the veterans program. President Obama has just appointed her to be the national director of veteran services, and she was approved. She said, Look, she was, had, had these metal poles, and she said, I can't even get a prosthesis. I lost both legs fighting for my country, and I'm the head of the VA program in Illinois, and I can't get two prosthetic limbs. Well, that's all going to change. On the same program, there was a young man who had just come back, and he, he was definitely affected by this. He's sitting in the garage. He has a gun in his hand. His wife goes into the garage and he says, I can't take it anymore. It, 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 there's just too many demons. I'm going to kill myself. She talks him out of it. She puts him in a car. They go to the VA hospital. They walk in. The intake person was not trained properly and said, listening to what was happening, that he had a loaded gun in his hand. You'll have to come back in six weeks. They should have immediately taken him in and put him under lock and key for his own protection. He went back with his wife, he went out in the garage, and he blew his brains out. Same day. I mean, these are obviously, uh, you know, shocking examples, but it's happening. There isn't, the VA is trying to get their act together, but if somebody is in that situation, they need to be seen immediately by six people, and you make sure that if you have to take away his belt, and you know, for his own good, because if he's dead, you can't treat him. 
and it's happening a lot. The suicide rate is 1,200% of what it is for non-Afghan uh, Iraqi soldiers, 1,200%. So we have a lot of work to do. Do you uh, receive or have you received benefits such as hospitalization, GI Bill, or other insurance benefits? Um, I am covered by VA medical insurance. As a matter of fact, the VA saved my life several times. I had open heart surgery in 2002. Um, uh, I didn't know it was that bad. And I mean, I don't look like somebody who's been through what I've been through. They diagnosed me with diabetes on Veterans Day. We finished the program I was producing in Framingham, got in the car, went to the VA hospital emergency room, and they admitted me. And they said, I'm surprised you're still standing. And they showed me what to do and how to do it. I've lost 43 pounds. I still have another 20 to go. Uh, I just picked up some pants at the cleaners, and he took four and a half inches out of the waist. Congratulations. And that's all because the VA has taken excellent care of me. I, I've been one of those people that uh, when I started losing my hearing, I went into the VA, and they fitted me with two hearing aids. And I can, today I'm wearing them, and I could, I lost 75% of my hearing. Was that service connected? Nope. Just happened. It doesn't have to be service mm -hmm. connected any longer. It used to be. Five years ago, if I had gone to the same audiologist in the VA, they would have told me I needed hearing aids. And they would have said goodbye and good luck. Now they make sure you have them. Now, you went back to college. Did you use the GI Bill for college yes. also? Mm -hmm. How important was it for you to not only, obviously, your part in this was as a chaplain and that was important, how important was it for you to serve in the military? Well, it, it was a matter of concern. My father, as I said, was an immigrant from Kiev, Russia, and he enlisted. His brother was born here, my uncle, and he enlisted. Um, it was part of the tradition of the family. Uh, they felt very strongly that if, you're, if you live in a country, you better do everything you can to keep that country free. Uh, he told me stories about what happened to him and my grandmother when they were leaving Russia. And he said, I, I just don't want to ever happen again. I want that opportunity to be there. And I felt pretty much the same way. I mean, I had some personal reasons for going into service, but I, it was important for me to do it. Conversely, my brother, who was five years younger, uh, the, the only argument of any consequence my dad and I ever had was I said, if push came to shove, and he did not want to go, because by that time, the whole world knew that this wasn't a legitimate war in Vietnam. Uh, I said, if he wants to go to Canada, that's fine with me. I want him to live. I don't want him to die. And I know enough people who died for nothing. You know, it's not, you keep hearing about uh, to victory with honor. Well, there wasn't a victory, and there wasn't any honor. The French couldn't defeat them, and they left. Now we're there. In Iraq, the Russians were there. They couldn't defeat them, so we went in. Well, you know, and now they're telling us to leave. I mean, it, it's, none of it really makes any sense. It's one of the reasons why this United Nations program that we brought in this last week was so important, because they're saying, whether you, you think the United Nations is right or wrong, whether you think it's perfect or flawed, the fact is, if we don't have peace, people are going to die. And if you have a choice between peace and war, take peace if you can. Did your father feel the same way about your brother going to Canada? Yeah, he was very angry that he wasn't going in. He came around, but it took a while. Do you feel that being in the service and as a chaplain in the service, that it in any way affected your life going forward? Well, not the, the chaplain part, certainly, but that's what I wanted to do. But I definitely came out much better than I went in. I mean, I had never, I, again, I was this little Jewish kid from Everett, and, and I never played sports, and I never was on the track team, and I didn't play hockey. I was a student. I was an academic. Uh, and it was complicated by the fact that my mother had a cerebral hemorrhage, hemorrhage and a heart, massive heart attack when I was 12. So I sort of became the head of household. My dad was working. I was going to school. I had a brother five years younger. 
and she continued to be ill. She lived to 84, but she had heart attacks all the time, and she'd be out of commission for a few months. So, you know, I came out much stronger. I mean, I couldn't believe that I made it through BASIC. And from what I understand now, what I had was a walk in the park compared to the Marines and, and what they go through. I mean, I'll tell you a funny story. The last week of BASIC training, we had a 50-pound a backpack and we had a hike. It was an all-night hike. It was canceled because of rain. Now, I mean, it sounds apocryphal, but I didn't make it up. We actually were all packed, ready that we have to take this hike. It's, it was called a survival hike, canceled due to rain. Somebody was looking over you. Well, that, that's the joke of all military about the Air Force, that, you know, they fly in, they have better food, they have nicer uniforms, and they fly out. Do you have anything you would like to share, another incident or thought or comment that you would like to share with your family and others who will be reviewing this tape? Well, as far as my family is concerned, I mean, I, I have one child, and she's now an adult, and she's very um, self-sufficient, very successful, uh, and I know, as a matter of fact, I, I was given a tribute by a congressman in California in 2000, before I left California. And in the tribute, it's a congressional tribute, it says, I, I gave him a quote that um, my daughter always said that one can make a difference. And if I die tomorrow, I know that she's gonna make the world better than she found it. And I try to do that, and my parents try to do that. And unfortunately, it's not a message that a lot of kids today have. I mean, I remember when I would pick my daughter up at uh, middle school or high school, and she'd have some friends with her, and they would say, yeah, we're going to the mall, and she'd say, well, my dad and I are going to the Low Cran School. It's for severely uh, mentally and physically challenged students. And, you know, we, we, I mean, we were doing things. We did it together from the time she was six. So she thinks all kids do that. Volunteering Volunteering services. in the community. Okay. Find a problem and go fix it. On my website, it says, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, quote, that uh, don't take the path well traveled, take a new path and, uh, and leave, uh, I don't remember the, the last word, but something about, you know, blaze a new trail. Get out there and it, get, don't have to do it the same way it's always been done. Well, that is a nice commentary to leave us today with, and we would like to thank you, M. David Cohen. And do you want to let us know what your website is? Yes, um, I have several. The, the one that deals with these projects is 21stCenturyProductions.tv. And is that? 21st, mm -hmm. the word century, the word productions, plural, dot TV. And uh, right now we're dealing with the United Nations comes to Massachusetts. The next time I update it, which will be in a week or two, it'll be Greenfest. Well, thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome.